Kia ora koutou, ngā mihi mahana kia koutou. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name's Tony Payne. I'm fortunate enough to be the CEO of Imagine Better, and it's a real uh, pleasure to welcome um, our, our gathering of panelists today, to welcome you who are, are on the uh, Zoom webinar, and also to welcome people who are watching the live stream of this event on Facebook. Um, I think I'll just uh, start with a little bit of housekeeping for those of you who are not used to this format. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so if you're here as a participant, um, you won't be on camera, and you, um, but we do encourage you if you've got any questions or answers to use the Q&A um, button, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and the chat function on Facebook is also available if you, which we'll be keeping an eye on. Um, uh, obviously, we, uh, we're also welcoming uh, Ruth and Rosie, who are our NZSL interpreters here today. Um, and I'm trusting that uh, you can all see them as we've spotlighted them on the screen as well, as well as the, myself and, the, and our four panellists. Um, I think everyone has an option to turn on closed captions. Uh, those, anyone who's used closed captions on Zoom before will know that there's a certain amount of um, uh, there's a certain distance between the words you say and the words that come up on the screen, but I think you've got the option to turn that on, on your own screen if, if you want to. Um, and we've also left the chat operational if you need any uh, technical assistance, and my colleague Susie is, um, is monitoring that as well. So um, with those bits of housekeeping and my um, best wishes to those of you who are in, who are in Auckland and joining us from a, another Level 3 lockdown, um, we'll, we'll make a start. And so I'll say a few words of introduction and then I'll ask our four panelists to introduce themselves and then we'll start the conversation about uh, what it means to be an ally in the disability rights movement. And so for the past couple of months, Imagine Better has been sharing guest blogs and other information about uh, what it means for non-disabled people to be part of the disability rights movement, to be part of a movement where we don't have lived experience, but we, uh, we care about the, the goals of the movement and we want to make contribute to making the changes that are, are so necessary in our world and our society and communities and, and families um, to create a, an inclusive and, and accessible world. Um, and we've been sharing that thinking because we think that's important. We think the disability rights movement needs non-disabled people to be participating in it. Um, it's a movement that needs to grow. It's a movement that um, needs more, uh, more fuel in the fire, if you like. We've got lots to do. We know we've got, you know, we're up against um, huge challenges and so we think it's a really important issue and, and so we, we wanted to, uh, to to share some thinking about that just to start encouraging that conversation uh, across New Zealand really. And so for the first of these panels and we'll be running a few more panels on various topics related to being an ally and check those out on the Imagine Better website. Um, we've invited four people um, to join us to have a general conversation about what being an ally means, um, thinking about what advice we might give non-disabled people who, who want to be part of that, that movement as, as allies and advocates, um, and also what that's been like for you both as uh, people with lived experience of disability and people as non-disabled people as part of that movement. So what I'd like to do to start things off though is just ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves um, and just to say, I invite you just to say a little bit about yourselves and, and where you're coming from and then we'll, I'll be posing a series of questions to the, to the mm -hmm. panelists and um, having a, a conversation that will, will take us through for the, for the hour that we've allowed. So I think um, Paula, will, if we could if we could come to you, Paula, um, it's lovely to, to see you and welcome you, our Disability Rights Commissioner. Um, but Paula, if you just like to say a few words of, of introduction and, and welcome, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Kia ora tātou, ko Paula Tisirero, tōko ingoa, ko o te huatanga mō te kahui, te katangata ki o te aroa. I'm Paula, the Disability Rights Commissioner, and I think this is such a wonderful discussion to be having and so critically needed. I asked a meeting I was in the other day if people knew what the A word was. I said, we need to be talking about the A word, and nobody came up with the word ableism. So it saddened me and reminded me of how important this conversation is. And in my role as the Disability Rights Commissioner, I meet with of course, many wonderful disabled people throughout the country, but I also meet with many wonderful allies. And so I see how great allies can be to our important mahi. So thanks, Tony, looking forward to this um, really important conversation. 
Uh, thanks, Paula. I'll just I'll just move around the, the screen. Missy, um, welcome to you from Auckland. Um, lovely to have you as part of this conversation, Missy Morton, disability um, scholar from um, from Auckland. Kia ora koutou, nga mihi nui ki a koutou koutou, ko Missy Morton toko ingoa. Um, thanks, Tony. I'd just like to echo what Paula has said about um, how excited I was to hear that this was happening and how honoured I've been to be selected as one of the people to participate. Um, so I'm working at the University of Auckland now. I teach disability studies and inclusive education. Um, and although I'm not currently identifying as disabled, disability has always been part of my life. Kia ora. Yeah. Kia ora, Kia ora Missy. Thank you and welcome. And um, Debbie, a warm welcome to you from, from Auckland as well, a public health educator, and I think also from the University of Auckland as well, um, Dr. Debbie Hager. Kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, I'm Debbie Hager. I have been working around the issues of disability and violence for a long time now and very pleased to be working with a group of people who understand that. So that's how Tony and I met. So thanks for including me in this conversation. Nice to see you everybody else. Thank you. Kia ora Debbie, welcome. And then heading a little bit south um, uh, in, the, in the big smoke, Mike, a welcome to Mike Potter, the CEO of, of Disability Connect. Kia ora tato. Yes, I uh, CEO of Disability Connect, and I identify as a person with a disability as opposed to a disabled person. And the reason for that is that I had an accident 13 years ago, and that led me into disability. So in terms of my understanding of the disability world, I understand people identify as disabled people, but that's my identity. And I'm a father. I have two daughters, one of whom has a learning disability. I have uh, found our family also that uh, have disabled children. And I work obviously with um, within Disability Connect. Uh, we work with parents and families with disabilities. So children with disabilities and their families in Auckland. Thank you very much, Imagine Better. Really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, um, welcome to you, Mike, and, and thanks for being part of, part of things. Um, it's lovely to have the, the four of you for this conversation, and I think I'll just echo that I think this is a really important conversation that, that uh, needs to continue well beyond, well beyond the hour that we've allotted for it. Um, so I wonder if, I'll, I'll, as I say, I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a conversation with each other, um, but I want to start with by posing a series of questions to you all, um, and we'll, 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 once again, we'll move around the group, and um, we'll sort of start this at random, I think. So I'll, I'll come to you, Missy, first. Um, what, what is the idea for you of non-disabled people being allies or advocates in the disability rights movement? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? And, and, and what's, what are the important dimensions of that for you? Um, I think being an ally um, at heart is about sharing the load, whatever the load might be, not taking it over, um, not owning it, um, but sharing it. So whatever the load might be, so um, I've, I thought about this and I wrote a little piece down. So I'll just read from mm -hmm. that and then you can um, ask me to clarify something you think, if you think I need to. So you, it's not expecting any one group to carry the burden of making all the changes that need to be made for all people. Being an ally is about recognizing the different kinds of leadership and expertise that is out there and making sure that there is space for those leaders and experts to be seen and heard. And this is the idea I think of, um, we talk about amplifying voices rather than speaking for or speaking over those voices. Mm. So I'll just leave it at that for now. Thanks, Missy. That's, um, I think the, and I think the, the idea of amplifying voices um, is particularly important. And um, I think one of the things we might, I'm hoping we might touch on, and those of you who know me know that this is a subject close to my heart is how we amplify the voices of people with learning disabilities. Yeah. Um, and people who are sort of neurodiverse and, and, and making sure that that's part of the, part of the, the amplification process as well. Well, can we come to you now? You, you said you, you meet a lot of people in your role, you know, it's, a, it's both disabled people and uh, non-disabled people who are, who are keen to be part of the change-making process. Um, what, what, is the, what is the idea of non-disabled people being allies or advocates mean to you and what do you see the dimensions of that, that role as being? I guess speaking both as a, a disabled person and as the Human Rights Commissioner. 
Yeah, thanks, Tony. And and um, completely, yeah, sort of um, want to echo the points that Missy made and perhaps build on on some of those. So I think allies are people who really get what ableism is about. They understand that it's embedded in structures and systems. It can be at that organizational level, the individual level, and realizing the responsibilities that we all have to break down the you know, to really dismantle those barriers. I think like the point that Missy made, it's this idea of, you know, being able to pick up the baton when we as disabled people ask for that. And it's never being a substitute for our voices, but actually when you are a disabled person and you're constantly advocating for change, it's exhausting, it's tiring, and, and it's really helpful actually to have people who are really authentic, who are in your corner, who you can just pass the baton to and have those voices um, amplified. I think non-disabled people as well are in a really um, important, or have an important role within their own organizations to help shape the disability narrative and start to break down barriers in their own organizations. I think one of the, the important dimensions of being an ally is being open to learning. And we all have to be open to learning, right? But, you know, making sure that people feel comfortable in asking questions. And I think we as disabled people need to be okay with those questions being asked. And, you know, it's about, it's about learning. It's about, um, stepping back and listening and understanding, being prepared to be corrected. And, you know, I think as long as that's done in a nice way, that's something that I, I hope allies, you know, can be okay with. And that's about, you know, making sure that we're all on the same page with, with our messaging. I think one of the other really important things that non-disabled allies can be part of doing is growing the network of allies. And, in many cases being quite deliberate and thoughtful about that. So often in my work, some of the, the best successes I see are where something is disabled led, but it also involves non-disabled people, it involves professionals, academics, it involves a, a range of people. And then you get this great sort of dynamism and um, contribution of thought. And you know, I think as long as in those conversations, there really is that listening to what disabled people want and say. So those are a few thoughts from me at this stage. Thanks, Paula. That, uh, that's, that's fantastic. And I'm um, reminded of, of, the, of the, that issue of being sort of open to critique and challenge. And I think that's one of the, I think in a lot of social movements, people are you know, nervous of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Or, and in fact, it was interesting when, when you introduced yourself, Mike, um, language is, is is such a sort of contested space in the, in, the, in the disability world, and we're wanting to get our language right, and people make different, you know, have different points of view about those things. So, um, and and sort of, I guess, trying to be reasonably robust about that as well. But Mike, can I come to you now and, and pose the same question? What does what does being an ally? How do you see that that role? What's important about it? What are the dimensions that are important to you? Um, being an ally in the disability rights movement. Yeah, I need non-disabled allies, and I need them at the top of the cliff, the middle of the cliff, and at the bottom of the cliff. And at the top of the cliff, you have government, and you have those in authority. In the middle of the cliff, you have people who are fronting with organizations and who are engaged around where I live. But at the bottom of the cliff is actually my community, where I live and where I operate. Naturally enough, most of my immediate allies are family members and my neighbors, uh, the people that I see on a weekly basis. But all of them, I need to have some level of understanding and much the same as, as what is Missy and, and Paul have said. I need them to have understanding. I need them to have empathy. I need them to show hospitality. And we need to have respectful dialogue. And to me, those are all really important aspects of, of what I need in an, in an ally. Uh, to have those good conversations uh, help. Thanks, Mike. Um, can I come to you now, Debbie, with the, with that same question? I'm conscious that you've, you know, for many years been advocating in the um, in the in the space and 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 have been worked as a um, 
particularly around the areas of violence and so forth. But um, that, that role of being an ally, being an advocate, uh, how do you see that playing out? And, and, and what do you think is important to, to, be, to bear in mind as you're thinking about that role? I hadn't really thought about the language of being an ally until you came to me with this idea. So I see myself as an advocate and I see advocacy as, as standing up for a particular issue. So advocating, or as Mike just said, at the top of the cliff. So working to try and change attitudes and values and policy around particular issues that I know about. So I was thinking that the really important things have, as have already been said, is about re really listening to people because as I've done my work trying to understand the intersection between violence and disability, I've heard a lot of things that I haven't understood because they're outside of my experience. And I think that the most critical thing in this area of, of advocacy and being an ally is to be open to recognizing when something's outside your experience and therefore just, just being with it and hearing it and believing it and therefore working from that place, even though it's not your place. I think what we do is we hear things constantly through our own filters. And I think the really critical thing about working in this space with people who, whose experiences are different is that you have to find ways to remove those filters and to advocate and work with people from a place of not even of shared understanding, but of where other people are. I think that's a, a really critical thing. And you know, talk more about this when we talk about sort of how others can help. But I think we have to recognize our own power and our own privilege and recognize how that plays out in relationships before that we can work equitably with people. So I come to this from a place of social justice. So if I'm going to work in the space of social justice, I have to recognize my privilege and how that impacts on my ability to get things done that other people may not have access to. And to work out how to use that power and privilege in a way which is constructive, not for me, but for the issues that I want to be engaged with. And, and I, look, I think, uh, Debbie, you've started that process of, of sort of, you know, what would, what would be your advice to, to someone who, who cares about uh, disability rights, who can see the injustices that, you know, the deep injustices that we, we have in our society um, related to disability. What would be your advice to someone who's, who's maybe, as a non-disabled person, sort of has that, has that passion, they get there's something wrong here. What, what, how would you start, how did, where to start and, and you talked about, you know, thinking about your privilege and, and, and um, checking your filters and, and, and your lenses. What else would you add to that list of, of advice that you'd give non-disabled people who are wanting to be part of the movement? For me, because I think it's important to work at a systems level, I think that we have to question the hegemony. I think we have to recognise the invisibility of ableism and how um, ableism is policed in all of its different ways. So people, um, people are, you know, there's a huge industry around perfect bodies and, and the way that we should be. And if we don't start investigating those things and really querying them and recognizing the power of them, it's we talk in deficit terms. So we talk in terms of marginalization and oppression and, and people who don't have something. I think that as non-disabled people who, who want to work in this space, we have to turn it around and look from the position of power and privilege and how that others people and silences people. So I think that we really have to start investigating at a level of power the other thing that I think is really important in any issue that you want to work in, and I didn't learn this for myself, I learned it from speaking to someone with a disability and we were talking about how you work with people 
is that you can't be in this for yourself and to feel good and to be praised. And what she said was, I can't work with people who need me to say thank you. Because mm. it's not about that. If you want to work in this area, and for me, if you want to work in the violence area, it's actually about making constructive social change. It's not about me and who I am and what's important about me. It's about the issues mm. and about the processes that we need to engage in to make change. Mm. And how I do that in a constructive and collaborative way with people and making sure that the voices that are heard are not my voice, but the voices of people who have the lived experience to, to really describe the circumstances. Um, oh my gosh, my, uh, my head is full of, of um, questions and, and thoughts from that. Um, but maybe just come up to you, Mike, and we can't have this conversation without talking about ableism. And, and, and as Paula said, the A word is, is, is a word that needs, is another word that needs amplifying. Um, what does ableism mean to you? And, and um, you know, can, can you offer us a, a quick definition? I don't like ableism. As a, as a like word? Or is... I don't like the word. I don't like the right. word sexism. I don't like the word consumerism. Uh, why don't I like, like these words? Because they, they identify a breakdown in community that there's something wrong within my community if those things exist. And that's what we're talking about. So for disabled people to not be accepted within the community is because they're not seen as having value or worth. That to me is what ableism mm. is yeah. and, and an understanding of that. So I really don't like the ism word. I understand we have to use them from a rights point of view, but I don't like them because of what they mean for my community and, and me. And I think the other part of that is, uh, and this is a challenge for disabled people also, I think we need to move on from being victims. So much we see ourselves as being victims, but going back to what Debbie said, if we can look at a strength uh, way of looking at things, a strength-based way of looking at things, we're not seeing the weaknesses. We're not seeing ourselves as victims. We're seen as people who, who have worth and have meaning and have value within our communities. And that we can advocate uh, a part of our role, I think, around ableism for a disabled person is to advocate and to educate one person at a time. Mm. I think at the top of the cliff, in terms of the systems, I absolutely agree. I think there's, there's, we need change there. But for that change to happen, we still need that change one person at a time to understand that the needs of, of disabled people for value and for worth and for belonging within Aotearoa New Zealand. Paula, one of the things I've seen you do a, a lot of is highlight the um, the very negative consequences of the way disabled people are treated. Um, you, you, you've been pretty forthright about the, the sort of the negative demographics of employment and poverty and violence and exclusion and poor housing and, you know, things that, that, that are, um, you know, truly stark indicators of, of what, we, what we're up against. Um, and I'm interested in that, in that, A, because that, I think that gives a point of your view on, on ableism, because it, 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 it is, as Mike says, not just a word, it's a it's a, something that's damaging people, but also about how we use that negative information. And I think that's something I'm really interested in for as a non-disabled person. Is it okay for me to talk about that negative information and, 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 and how, can I, you know, how can I do that? And I'm so interested in your, you must have thought through about how being careful about that, presenting that very negative picture of, of the consequences of ableism um, and getting the balance right. And how to, how to non-disabled allies how do we react to that and can we is that something that you know how do you think about that i think you're right it is it is a balance and something that i am very conscious of and and actually i think that you know part of the reason that i often um really talk about that sort of the lay of the land for disabled people is because at the heart of it is really trying to unpack that um sort of structural level of ableism, which is you know, all about our systems and our structures that devalue disabled people and, and can exclude us. And I found this really interesting sort of set of quotes actually in um, a report that the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities wrote about ableism. And I won't read it sort of verbatim, but it talks about this idea that it is generally assumed that the quality of life of persons with disabilities is very low. 
that they have no future to look forward to and will never live happy and fulfilling lives. Ableism leads to social prejudice, discrimination against and oppression of persons with disabilities as it informs, and I underscore, it informs legislation, policies and practices. So that idea about structural ableism is, is really critical. And I think one of the things that, you know, we, we, we really need to be growing this awareness of how that structural ableism leads to poor outcomes. And I, we cannot afford to shy away from those poor outcomes in New Zealand because frankly, if, all of these surveys that are coming out are placing um, disabled people, you know, ones that have come out recently, are placing disabled people in a position that, you know, we, we, we don't want to be in. And so there is a balance to be struck though about highlighting that and then I think it's about talking about how you shift that narrative so one of the things you know you'll also hear me often talk about is the social model of disability and that idea that well it's not about me as a disabled individual that needs to change here this is about how society can change how our how our structural um, ableism can be addressed how society can organize itself to remove barriers and so it is a balance but it, it, you know I do think we need to be able to highlight to decision makers um, you know the very real gravity of the situation because there's always a risk we will be left behind if we're not um, you know amplifying those those key messages and I think I sort of just wanted to, to pick up on a point that um, Debbie made really nicely because I think it's a really important one and it's sort of around authenticity and you know she talked about it in the sense that you know you don't do this kind of work because you want a, a thank you and I have to say you know um, I don't know what, what other disabled people listening to this find but you can tell who's authentic in this mahi and, and sort of who's not and often I will get people come and see me and they will talk about, they will describe themselves as being an ally of the disability community and then proceed to tell me everything that needs to happen in a language that's actually not the language that we speak. And, and then there's people who will do what you described, Debbie, which is more that sort of sense of listening, reflecting, stepping back and not speaking for disabled people and having all the solutions, but actually navigating that that path quite carefully. So I just sort of wanted to pick up on that because I think authenticity is, is really important and mm. I should be quiet now and I'll come back to some of my other points later. Well, Missy, that, that's a, a great um, segue to, to you, I think, because I'm, I'm, I'm keen to ask you, I think, about the emotional costs of being, being an ally. Um, and also because you're in the world of, of academia and, and that, you know, you have, the, you have a, a unique ability to speak truth to power, I guess. Hey, hey, can we, can we talk a bit about both the personal things and some of those wider things that you've been involved in as, as an ally? Um, because, you, because you are able to, to highlight things and, 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 and tell people how, you know, what's, what's going on. But perhaps we could start with just the, what's your advice to, to non-disabled people in dealing with the challenges that will be personal and emotional about being part of this work? I'm thinking about all the things that yeah, I know. Mike and Debbie and Paula have uh, said, but I'll try to stick to the brief you've just given me now, Tony. <laughs> it's pretty wide. Wish me luck. <laughs> um, so, so let's let's. I'll start with the piece about um, being in. A, so I'm in a position of influence in an influential position, right? In an influential agency. So I probably see a thousand students a year at least directly. Most of them are teacher education. Some of them are learning to be teachers or social workers or uh, work in the sport and health kind of field. So I see that as a privilege and an incredible obligation to do some of the kind of work that people are talking about now. And um, so I'm guided by my understanding of ableism. We'll just jump a little bit here as being something that has to be dealt with on both an individual level, how do we respond to that as individuals, but also how do we, I see ableism as the name we give 
to many people's experiences that helps them understand, helps us understand it's not just me. Right? So I think that's really important, whether we call it domestic, uh, domestic violence, or we call it all the different names we've had to go through the years to name people's experiences that help them understand it's not just me. This is coming at me from a great height in many different directions. And I guess the other thing I'd say is that ableism doesn't happen in a vacuum, but maybe more about that later. So part of what I do in my teaching and my own learning um, is to explain the concept of ableism, but always to do that through magnifying, starting with the voices of people for whom that, that's part of their lives. And so um, as an example, I'll use the videos that have been made from the Voices Project, right, which are interviews with lots of young disabled New Zealanders about their experiences in the school system and other parts, because mostly I'm, this is for young teachers or beginning teachers. Um, and that does two things. It starts the conversation with the voice of a disabled person. And it also introduces those students to a set of resources that otherwise they would never have access to. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Then I say to them, we we'll talk about how difficult it can be when you're in a, you're a new person in a setting, a school, for example, with its own set of cultures and rituals, and you're told, well, this is what it's like in the real world now, Cookie, um, which means don't tell us all this stuff you wanna change here kind of stuff. And I say, it's really important to find allies in that work. And by allies, I mean everybody, anybody who comes to work with a fire in their belly because they see that the system is not fair or just, they might start out with the word racist, they might find that a bit too much to begin with as a descriptor, but it's really important to find allies who are, who share a social justice agenda. For me, I'm particularly interested in a disability justice agenda, which I think is, you know, more specific and, and wider, but you need to find people who will be sounding boards for you, um, they might not want to make the same changes you want to make, but they might have some strategies that you could share for making changes. I think that's, um, that's really important uh, to have. I remind them that when you make something a, a or challenge a little bit what you said, that changing the system, you can't change the system one person at a time. And why do I say that? It's from watching inclusive education first being promoted as something we would do one thing at a, one student at a time, and that's not changed the system. Um, the other thing I'd say about reaching out for allies from allied fields, not only people with experience or concern around disability, is this idea of intersectionality. Mm -hmm and that everybody's experience is multifaceted. I have privilege in some circumstances and not in others, and that's true for all of us. So it reflects the complexity of people's experiences. But the other thing I'm really mindful of, and this comes back to what you were saying too, Mike, is that um, there are many, many examples of disabled leadership that can uh, shape and teach us. I'm trying to stay away from inspire because I'm a bit worried about the inspiration porn kind of thing, but um, it's not that it's, so I'm thinking about, for example, um, the Disability Justice Culture Club, this group out of San Francisco who've led enormous amount of work around uh, providing support for people in COVID, not just disabled people, um, but people who have been made vulnerable by the system right by the way the system sets up. Um, so is that kind of what you were saying to have kind of branched into what we what we could learn and also try to sort of speak a little bit to the point that disabled people are not only on the victims or on the receiving end of help, mm -hmm. they also have an enormous amount of strength that um, lots of situations. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really fascinated by all the strands of this conversation because it's, it's, it's very multifaceted, but I wonder if I can pick up on one thing and just throw it open to the four of you. And that, that is, what do you, and it comes to that point of sort of intersectionality that you made in the sea about, 
it, from where I'm sitting, it does feel to me like the disability rights movement in, in New Zealand um, has a bit of catching up to do with some of the other social movements that we're seeing in our, in our world. Um, and I, you know, we can maybe talk about why that is, but perhaps more profitably about what, what do you think we could learn from those other movements, the, the climate justice movement or the rainbow justice movement or the, or the race justice movement? What are some of the things, and I'll just throw that out to you, what can, what, what can we learn from those movements and, 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 and use in terms of both, the, you know, because all of those movements have got allies as part of their, their world, um, but also the techniques and strategies that they're using. I'm happy to offer a couple of conversation starters, Tony, which is, um, and look, there, there's many, but a couple that spring to mind, I think. One, you know, in the, in the disability community, I think one of the things that often you know, people talk to me about, and I've certainly, certainly experienced this myself growing up, is that, you know, this, this real sort of structural level ableism that exists and these barriers that are put in place, it's very hard not to internalise those. And so actually there's quite a, a need for the disability community ourselves to have a conversation about ableism and find ways to really support that you know, not internalizing that that ableism because that does have and you know can have a very ongoing impact in the way that that you view things and and that you know we do our work. So, I guess in a way that's possibly a little different from some of those other movements. There is that internal sort of piece to to kind of work on. Then I think the other. Um, thing I've observed about some of those other social movements is that being very collectively loud and I think sometimes in the disability community um, sort of if, even if I perhaps just think over the past 10 years or so um, it has been really strong groups doing great things but I think we've got a big opportunity to be a really strong stronger collective voice um, I think, you know, social change programs too that have been really successful have had a multitude of expertise and, and people involved. And so things, opportunities like this today are, are the very sorts of opportunities that start to bring voices together and shape how, um, you know, a conversation might happen. Um, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the things that some people on this call will have heard me talk about um, is really wanting to have a national conversation about disability. And so one of the things that we will be doing is um, we've just secured the funding actually to start doing a co-designed piece of work with the disability community and others around what such a conversation might look like. And so we'll be doing the co-design this year with a view to then implementing that over the next two to three years and you know I've always been a very very big believer in this work that big P policy levers and this this may be where we've been a bit slow on the uptake Tony with some other movements is I think for a long time we have focused on those big P policy levers and they're critical they're really important that that big policy change is is, is critical but I think in parallel is that work around attitudes and if we can really start to accelerate that alongside the big p policy work then we might nudge things along so that that's sort of for me a learning with those other social movements that it hasn't been about only the policies it's been a big sort of uh, change campaign around attitudes so um, today contributes to that and i think you know we can we can do more um, about that so those are few thoughts from me to kick it off. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Thank you, um, I will. Picking up on what you said, Paula, one of the things I was thinking about before we came here when the Tony's question, what are the most urgent changes required? One of the things I've found really interesting when I look back at my own development of understanding and when I work with people is all of the stereotypes around who a disabled person is and what a disability is. And I think when we look at the stats and it says, you know, basically 25% of people 
have um, indicated that they've had a disability. I think when I ask people who in their family has a disability and um, in a group of 20, you know, three or four people will put their hands up and then you do a kind of description of what disability is and the breadth of what that is and what it means. And then every single person in the whole room puts their hands up. And so when I was thinking what needs to happen, I was thinking that part of this is just me because I come from a family where as I've learned, you know how as you learn more, you realize, oh, both of my parents had different kinds of disabilities there's a whole lot of disabilities in my really close family that have developed for various reasons. I think it's really interesting when we stop thinking about disability as them and we start re recognizing that disability is us, that it's, and that immediately changes the whole conversation. Going back to intersectionality, which we were talking about before, I think some of the things that we've that's really important to learn for me having been advocating for the same things for a long time is that it takes a really long time you know we're still talking about the anti-racism movement we're still talking about rainbow community movements you know we we haven't got there yet but people persevere and I think that's a really critical thing I I think of the times when I've just cried with frustration because nothing happens so, you know, there's this kind of, there's this element of we all have to keep each other going and support each other because nothing happens quickly, um, which is an important attribute, I think, for an advocate. Maybe not the crying, the other bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the crying. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said this before, but I just wanted to reiterate it, is that we are, it's, it's a growing process, isn't it? That's what we've learned through these other movements is that we start in one place and we learn. We learn strategies, we learn more about the issues, we learn more about how we address the issues, we get more sophisticated in what we do and then we realize we're at a dead end and we regroup and we go somewhere else. So it's a sort of iterative process as we learn more and listen to the really diverse voices. Start off working with these people and the the, the voices grow and so the options grow. I think that's enough from me at the moment. And Debbie, you just brought something up that I, I was pleased with Missy identifying the Voices Project because one thing that for us to have social change, true social, true social change, is the voice of the voiceless. Uh, and it's a really important thing, I think, for anyone within the, the rights movement for disability. Uh, is to be able to, to have allies and friends who don't have a voice and to un spend time with them, understand their situation. Um, and, and I have in my mind uh, a young man I know who's 26 who lives on the autism spectrum with his brother and his mother and he just doesn't have a voice. And yet when I spend time in his company, I, I learn what he really needs and I have the privilege of being able to speak so it, it enables me to have, have a voice within that and for you in education Missy and, and Debbie for you to carry those voices with you that's going to help us to have, have true change. Um, I, I think that's a really important thing to be able to carry forward is just that, that voice the voiceless. It takes a long time to actually pick up all those voices and carry them with us but we're not going to have true inclusion. We're not going to have everyone behind us in a movement if those voices aren't included. Um, I've, a question has come through on the Q&A, which, which relates to the conversation, sort of the intersection conversation, and um, a question from Kerry ann um, How does ableism impact on non-disabled people? And I'd have to say that uh, our second panel is that we are going to be talking to people people who are parents of, of, of disabled children and I think you know uniquely parents of disabled children um, can feel the weight of ableism very very strongly when we're dealing with schools and things like that but um, is there a sense in which ableism is negative for us all and, and what and what is what's your sense of that and is that a helpful concept to, to, to promote and I, I think there's a bit of that that um, you know we universal design 
helps us all whether we're pushing a wheelchair in a wheelchair or, or um, pushing a pram or whatever but is, is, is there a deeper sense to that that, 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 that the challenges of ableism are something that if we can get on top of them that, that it makes it's well, well, well better for everybody i'm happy to have a thanks Missy. Yeah. Of that. Um, I think this is a really important question, Kirian, and uh, I think all of us have referred to it in some way or another, but um, I, I think of it in terms of ableism doesn't occur in a vacuum. So there are larger discourses or larger ways of thinking about the world um, that really privilege only a very small group of people and that only a very small group of people benefit from. And um, Debbie, I think, talked about it earlier about the, you know, the notion of the ideal body or the perfect body or who the hell got to decide what normal is and how does that continue to impact all of us? Yeah. So, um, so on one level, I agree absolutely to say ableism affects everybody, whether it's our various fears of our own mortality or um, some kind of naive belief that anybody is independent and we all want to be autonomous and be able to do everything on our own. I mean, that's not a very helpful or healthy myth. Mm -hmm. um, so on one hand, I think, as I said, I think ableism does impact all of us, but it impacts us differently. And so I think there's a, um, a kind of nuanced or, and important distinction to be made between ableism impacts ableism impacts all of us but some of us still have privilege even within that and so we're not all impacted equally if that makes sense mm. Paula. i think yeah th those are great points missy and, and perhaps building on those i think kerry ann and others i think fundamentally it, it actually does affect us all i think any any idea that promotes the exclusion of, of a group or groups in our society harm the rest of us. And I think we've had enough experience in New Zealand in recent years to see how much we have to evolve as a country around truly understanding what social inclusion means. And so I think at that very broad high level, absolutely it, it affects all of us and should affect um, all of us. I think the other thing is, um, you know, and you, you touched on this, Tony, around parents and families. Um, you know, so often the parents and families who talk to me are, are at their wits' end. And because they, you know, you know this more than me, Tony, in terms of being a, a parent um, of a disabled person, is that, you know, that, that constant fighting, now that fighting wouldn't exist in large part if we didn't have an ableist society. So actually, I'd like to think that in removing those barriers for disabled people, we also remove some barriers actually for um, non-disabled people. And I think, you know, as a disabled person, I've certainly seen family and friends of mine over the years who have been really hurt by things that have been said to me, which on the face of it might appear quite innocent from non-disabled people, but actually using very ableist language. And so it, it hurts those that um, love us and, and are our friends. And so I think, you know, at a number of levels, actually, it does have um, an impact on non-disabled people. And no, of course, it's, it's different than the impact it directly has on us as disabled people. But actually, I think that's why this conversation and other ones like this are so important because it recognises that actually it does affect us all. And, you know, in the same way that, you know, racism affects the country that I love, I'm in a privileged position on that front and I'm not directly affected by it. But it upsets me that our country is not in a position where we're much more evolved. So, yeah, I, I absolutely think it does, Kerry Ann, and I think it is part of this important conversation. Um, I'm conscious that we've got about uh, ten minutes to go, and I suspect we could. <laughs> this is a this is the work of a lifetime, so um, it's it's been, been great to have this conversation. But I, I wonder if we can um, start to pull some of this together. I might I might come back to that sense of um, the 
you know, what, what encouragement and advice do you, do you each have for, for people who are considering becoming allies? I'm particularly interested in, in before we, just before we land there, perhaps just come back to this thing of what I see in other, in other movements. And I'm thinking particularly of the, the Treaty of Waitangi and, and racism movement in New Zealand, the place for um, Pākehā people to talk to each other. It's, it's, it's actually a point that you reminded me of, Mike, is that allies need to be allies to each other. You know, when there's a sense in which we can support each other as we do this, and I don't want to make a meal of that because you could spend all we could spend all our time sort of having support groups and not getting anything done. But you know that sense that there's a place for Pākehā to talk to each other and then engage with Māori. And I wonder if there's a similar dynamic for non-disabled and disabled people in our conversations with each other. Um, you know, how does that play out? And I, I think I've seen, you know, the, the idea of sort of break, you know people seeing that as a bit, a bit divisive, but I think maybe there's a place for that. So uh, perhaps a comment of that from each of you and, and some final words of, of, of advice or, or support or, or um, encouragement to people to, to pick up the, the challenges. I think we're laying down some challenges, which are, for, you know, non-disabled people uh, control, you know, where does ableism live? Who controls it? Who, it's, it's, not a, it's not a sort of a fairy, fairy thing. It's actually in the hands of people who are making decisions about systems and how they, how we build buildings and how we run schools and, and how we, you know, how we do how we do everything, including our attitudes. So, question about the place of call it caucusing. That's a pretty woke sort of phrase, but that you know the ability of non-disabled people to talk to each other and then engage, and then then some final advice. So I'm happy to let you decide who wants to go first with those two questions. And I think that by the time we get round the group, that may um, may wrap things up. So, who'd like to start? I. Uh, I think I said a lot of things that I was thinking about, but just in response to what you're saying, many, many years ago, when Tony and I both worked in sexual health, <laughs> a long time ago, and I was wondering why um, the organization that I was with didn't work with disabled people and talked to my friend who worked at um, CCS Disability about the idea of, of doing sexuality work with disabled people. And she said to me, you can't do this without talking to disabled people. It was just, and so she introduced me to some wonderful people and we started working together. So I think that we can want to do something, but actually I think it's really critical to talk to people first, to talk to disabled people first and do that listening and do that understanding and do that, that recognition of what the issues are before I go and, I mean, that was a non-disabled person who told, told me that first thing. Um, but for me, it was critical that I listened to the voices first so that I was starting from a place of shared understanding. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Debbie. I'm happy to go second. Um, I'm, I'm, I realise I'm not answering your question directly, Tony, about whether non-disabled people should caucus. I definitely know there's there's value in our community of disabled people caucusing, <laughs> um, mm. but but caucusing um, in that supporting each other, you know, um, frame because. You know, this work is difficult and one of the things that I know about this work and as a disabled people person is when you are disabled and you spend your career and most of your life doing things that are related to disability, um, it, it can be, I mean, it's of course it's brilliant on the one hand, but there are days where it can be very draining and so actually having that that sort of network of allies within the disability community is also incredibly important, but also um, to be able to reach out to, to non-disabled people and get a, a perspective on things. I think just sort of finishing up from my perspective around that advice question you asked, I think, you know, language as we know is, is so important. And, you know, I think oh, one of the one of the biggest sort of um, ableist kind of um, things that people often say to me 
um, and this is, is generally non-disabled people who will say, oh, I don't like the word disability, Paula, so I won't use that. And I'm thinking, but this is core to my identity. This is who I am. And when people say, oh, you've, but, you know, you've achieved a lot despite your disability. I'm, no, I've achieved everything I've achieved because of it. And it's really hard sometimes for many non-disabled people to realize this is my identity. It is core to, to everything. And I think understanding that as, a, as an ally, um, you know, can, can go a long way. I think the other thing is, and, you know, we haven't really touched on this, but sort of finding out the laws and things that are designed to protect disabled people um, and, you know, making sure that, that, you know, people are familiar with that. Creating space for disabled people to... Um, have their voice and you know I've seen that done really well um, where that space has just been wonderfully created um, and I think the other thing and we touched on this before but it is about understanding the data what does the data and evidence tell us about what is occurring in New Zealand and we've had that discussion about how much do you speak about those negative stats um, but we've all got to understand them because if we don't it's hard to see how we will how we will change the things that critically need uh, changing so but I, I mean I probably want to finish my comments by a huge thank you to our allies because as you said Mike at the start you know oh my gosh we need um, we need our allies and so you know thank you for the really authentic way in which you do that Tony um, and and also Missy and Debbie I've worked with you now for you know a few years and that authenticity just really comes through and, and it's so important and and so gratefully received. Thanks Paula. Um, uh, one minute each Mike, Missy and Mike. Missy and Mike. I, I, I don't mind going next. Um, I agree with you. Paula was saying the efficacy around language and including I think it's really important for our disability organisations to be included with anything that goes on with society, uh, and it needs to be cooperation and collaboration. So if you have an organisation and you're, you're, you don't have a disability, you need to engage people with do and, and people who have those voices and carry those voices if you're going to build a community. Um, the other thing, question was just around um, a long-term perspective I, I think we really need a long-term perspective in this country. Uh, so often our government is responding to urgent and so the same with the disability community. But why don't we have a long-term perspective? Um, when we're looking at the environment, we have goals for 2050 of carbon neutral. We have goals in health for being smoke free, but where are the goals for, for disabled people with their disability strategy? And it could be in housing, it could be employment, it could be in education, but we don't have any long-term goals so we don't have anything that we are pushing towards collectively. And that's what I would love to see. Thanks, Mike. Lassie. Um, Two things really quickly. Um, as a person who is upper middle aged, I'm still learning how to get over myself. And I get this helpful advice from my children and my students. And um, so one advantage of caucusing occasionally is to be around other people who are also learning over how to get over ourselves and um, think about, you know, how that might work and, and why that's a good thing to do from time to time. Um, one thing I would say is that there is so much work to be done to achieve a non-disabling society and to understand ableism and its effects. And we need all of us and all our various positions um, from grassroots to uh, people who are working in positions of, in organizations or leadership positions like yourself, Paula. And so one thing I don't think we've yet done is um, think about all the different strands of work that need to be done and how we could be each chipping away at each piece of that instead of feeling like we're, sometimes we're in competition, or that's probably not the right word, but, um, just figure out how we might braid this river so it's all going in the same direction, if I can now mix metaphors. So uh, kia ora koto to imagine better and uh, for this fantastic opportunity to, to learn from you all. Um, well, uh, thank you, Missy. And I, I have to say that there's a very common theme to these conversations and, and imagine better when we host our Generations of Change series. 
uh, last year, we always end up saying we need to be more collectivized. We need to be more working for a common cause. And I hear that so much. And I think, well, how hard can that be in a country of five million people? But it remains a challenge for us all, doesn't it? Look, it just leaves um, a little bit of time for me to just to say thank you to everyone. Can I say, say thank you uh, to my colleague, Susie, who's been running things behind the scenes. Um, thank you to Rosie and Ruth, our NZSL interpreters, for, um, for your work with us today. And, but, but, and of course, a very warm thank you to Debbie, Missy, Paula, and Mike. Um, I know these are issues that you've been thinking about, um, not just for the, for the hour today, and that you'll continue to think about. So thank you for your wisdom, for sharing uh, your insights and a bit about yourselves and, and how that's impacted on you personally. And from Imagine Better's point of view, we look forward to continuing to be part of this conversation about um, how we can make the disability rights movement uh, stronger and, and more effective and including the role of non-disabled people. So, and then finally, uh, thank you to those of you who've been, uh, who've joined us on the webinar. I understand we've had a few technical issues with the Facebook feed, but we will be, we have recorded the, um, we have recorded the conversation, so we'll make that available. Uh, I saw what someone on the chat saying, I'm glad you're recording this because there's so much rich content here. I'm going to need to watch it again. So we'll take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you all of you for, for, for spending the time with us and for also engaging with these issues. So on that note, I wish you all the very best and uh, look forward to continuing to see you as uh, as we continue this, the work that we're all doing together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.